At the northwestern extreme of North America lies the rich territory of Alaska, westernmost continental possession of the United States, one-fifth as large as the 48 states. Here the mountainous backbone of the continent turns westward, breaking up into several lofty ranges. The Arctic Circle cuts across Alaska, whose polar sea region has long winters and is very dry. The central portion is the vast forested basin of the historic Yukon River. Along the southern coast, the warm Japan current brings a mild climate and moisture-laden clouds. These, floating north and east, strike the coastal mountains and give rise to the world's largest continental region of glaciers. On the sharp western mountain slopes, the heavy rainfall supports vast forests, which are all accessible from tidewater. Forests that grow in extreme density, forests of Sitka spruce and other valuable timber supported by the ample rainfall of the region. The resources of Alaskan forests are only now beginning to be developed. Hardy lumberjacks from Canada and Washington and Oregon find a familiar field of effort among the towering giants in Alaska's Pacific timber belt. Men to whom the wilderness is home. Young men like Axel Johnson of Scandinavian origin and Canadian training. Veteran lumberjacks like Michael Grady, late of Seattle. In the major part of Alaska's lumbering activity, such men work under strict government supervision and in the interest of conservation because virtually all good saw timber is cut from national forests. It is usually only a few miles by tidewater transportation from forest to mills along the coast, a circumstance which contributes to keeping down the cost of building lumber for Alaska's business and residential communities. The greater part of the timber cut annually is sawed into lumber. The balance remains in the round for wharves and fisheries. Most mill workers, like John Reeves here, live in homes near the mills with their families, in houses built of native lumber. Because of a lack of other materials, most of Alaska's construction is of native wood. Most important commercially of all Alaska's resources today are the salmon which each year come from the sea and ascend streams to spawn. Once faced with extermination, the salmon are now under strict government supervision and the legal annual limit of the catch is based on the number of fish which go upstream to the spawning grounds each spring. At the mouths of streams along the coast, individual fishermen follow the salmon with gill net and trap. These men, who perhaps are fur hunters in winter, work hard through the brief fishing season and, most commonly, turn over their cats to busy little tugs and barges sent out by the more than 100 large canneries. Scores of large fish traps set along the coast contribute heavily to the annual catch. Winches haul up the brailing nets, which transfer fish from trap to barge. Each haul nets hundreds of pounds of fighting salmon. The holes are quickly filled. During each short summer season, hundreds of millions of pounds of Alaska salmon are caught. Day and night during the two months of the fishing season, the unending stream of fresh-caught salmon is carried up from barge to cannery. Men of half a dozen nationalities work at feverish speed side by side with wives of local residents. In two months' time each summer, thousands of workers in the world's most modern canneries process millions of cases of salmon worth many millions of dollars. Like Alaska's other products, most of the rich salmon harvest goes outside by ship principally to United States Pacific ports such as Seattle, Washington, for worldwide distribution. Ships carrying salmon to these ports exchange this cargo for industrial products, such as mining machinery. For next to fishing, Alaska's chief resource today lies in her minerals. Here near Fairbanks, a leading gold mining center, gigantic placer mining operations for gold are carried on. First, huge hydraulic washing removes overlying soil down to the underlying layers, which are frozen the year round. Next, the frozen gravel, after holes have been drilled into it, is melted by streams of water, for it must be removed before the gold can be recovered. Modern tractors, operated by men, some of whom come from the states for the short season, further remove surface soil to get down to pay dirt 
beneath. Finally, great dredges scoop up the gold bearing gravel and soil on endless chains of buckets operated by day and night shifts of skilled operators. The value of Alaska's mineral reserves is known to be vast. To mining operations throughout Alaska, the airplane is of vital importance. Here machinery is being loaded at the Fairbanks airport, destined for a remote mine. And here supplies, both for mining and trapping camps, far in the interior, months distant by water in summer, weeks by dog or horse team in winter. Alaska, almost overnight, changed from the dog sled and riverboat to the air. Planes for doctors and nurses, planes for the mails, planes for making aerial maps of the vast interior region, much of which has never been surveyed. Air travel begins where the few highways and railroads leave off. Fairbanks is the northern terminus of a 470 mile line from Seward, government owned and operated, virtually the only railway in Alaska. This line is a boon to Alaskan agriculture, however, running through the fertile Matanuska Valley, which with the more northern Tanana Valley forms Alaska's principal agricultural region. On the Matanuska Valley farm of the Staffords, a heavy harvest of field peas indicates the richness of the soil and its productivity during the growing season. In the Matanuska Valley, the climate has no great extremes and mountain ranges protect the valley against the fierce blizzards of winter. Here, Mrs. Stafford's flowers grow to fantastic size under the warm summer sun, although the ground beneath is perpetually frozen. Here, hardier vegetables such as lettuce, radishes, turnips, cabbage, carrots, and potatoes grow in prolific fashion. Hanging on the walls is trapping equipment, which the staffers will use during the long months when their land is blanketed by snow. Although these vegetables compare favorably with those grown farther south, there are as yet not enough raised in Alaska to supply local needs. Grain crops such as wheat, and the oats here being harvested are used by the Staffords and other Matanuska Valley farmers as feed for livestock, chickens, hogs, and even more valuable, the cattle that furnish both meat and dairy products. For Alaskan whites, Indians, and particularly for Eskimos, the vast herds of reindeer, numbering hundreds of thousands, are the most important livestock. Thousands of natives depend principally upon reindeer for food and clothing. During the long winter months, much fur clothing is worn by Indians and Eskimos who have traditional skill in their preparation. Modern fur farming has come upon the Alaskan scene, partly because fur-bearing animals of the region produce fine pelts due to the severe winter weather. Furthermore, fish are plentiful and constitute a major item of diet for these animals. Blue, cross, and silver foxes make up the bulk of fox farm varieties. Mink farming has also been included as a source of valuable Alaskan furs. Most mink and fox farms are on islands just off the Alaskan coast. It is certain that Alaska's fur farming industry could accommodate a great increase without crowding the world's fur market. By no means the least of its resources lie in Alaska's varied and spectacular offerings for tourists. The annual tourist population is greater than the number of permanent residents. Old forts and churches are reminders of Russian rule. Elsewhere on lofty totem poles are inscribed family histories of Indians who have long dwelt in southeastern Alaska. Alaska's five mountain ranges offer alpine scenery with a rich panorama of glaciers famous for variety and beauty. On the coast, icebergs break off from the walls of the valley glacier terminals. Along the coast, there is village life in great variety. Beckoning the adventurer, Alaska's mountains offer untraveled depths beyond for exploring, for prospecting, or for hunting wild game such as bear and mountain sheep. Within easy reach are crystal lakes and snow-clad mountains, and loftiest of all peaks in North America, the majestic snow-clad sentinel, Mount McKinley. <laughs>